Hi and welcome to another episode of Ecom at One. Today, today's guest is Mike Rhodes, founder and CEO of Web Savvy, an all-round PPC legend, if I could say so myself. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? Are you okay? <laughs> I am marvellous, mate. Great to be here, Richard. Uh, Richard, thanks for having me on, mate. No problem. Well, I was saying to Mike before we jumped on, um, Mike's somebody I've personally been learning from for, uh, I think, a good sort of half a dozen years or more. A lot of the guys in the agency plow through a lot of Mike's training. He's very well known um, in, in the agency world and also very well known in the PPC and AdWords world. So I really, really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your, your knowledge. So I think it'd be great for, for the listeners to really understand how you've managed to scale your business um, into one of the top agencies in the world? Um, wow. Uh, a whole lot of luck, I think, is probably the main <laughs> element there, frankly, um, and a bloody amazing team. Yeah. Um, and those two things combined, you know, uh, the first guy I hired was with me for nine years before he went off oh. to create a, a VR business. Yeah. Um, five of the other six people that have been with me for seven years plus are wow. still here. Yeah. So that longevity makes your life um, much easier as a business owner, obviously. Um, a very understanding wife, um, some <laughs> incredible clients, um, and technical term, a shit ton of hard work. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of luck. Great team, great yeah. clients. And uh, I, I, somebody once told me, uh, like, the, the secret to business. I'm like, oh, go on then. <laughs> the secret to business. This is not Richard Branson's guaranteed <laughs> way to become a millionaire, is it? Because I know that one. Uh, that's always good. For, we can do that at the end, if you like. A guaranteed way to become a millionaire, if you want it. But yeah, the secret to business is just stay in the ring, he said. Yeah. He said, you're going to get knocked over a ton of times. Yeah. Keep getting up, stay in the ring. Like the longevity and just still still playing the game. Yeah. Um, you will get there over the journey. You know, we, we look at people that are successful and we don't, we forget that we're just looking at the last two pages of the book. Yeah. We forget that all of the work, you know, the overnight success that's a decade in the making. Um, yeah, yeah. Love it. I think stay in the reason. ring. I'll remember that one. I think this is it, isn't it? The reality is we only see the, the highlights on social media, don't we? The, of the, Absolutely. The, the, the best 5% of someone's life. And <laughs> probably not a true reflection of what's going on. Absolutely. So going back, you said about team and hiring. Obviously, you've had some great hires and, and guys that have been with you a long, long time. I think, you know, guys that are listening into the episode, e-commerce store owners, um, but, uh, mm. you know, they maybe got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, obviously all different stores listening. Um, what will be some of your sort of tips and things that you've, you know, that have really helped <laughs> people hire and retain, I think is the trick, isn't it? <laughs> well, on the hiring side, um, find people that are good at hiring. I don't, think I'm particularly good at hiring. I think I got lucky in the early yeah. days. My GM now does a fantastic job with my head of Google and head of Facebook. They, I haven't really <clears throat> been involved in hiring for the last wee while. And yeah. that's great because I don't think I'm particularly good at it. I rock up and don't bring a notepad to write down the answers and ask a bunch of random questions. And now there's a process to it, which is a much better way to do it apparently. Yeah. Um, on the retention side, this is going to sound really trite, but I think you just got to really care about your team. You've got to give a damn. Yeah. And yeah. what matters to them? Um, another mentor once said to me, think of them as volunteers because they're volunteers. They volunteer to come back the next day. Sure, you pay them a bit in exchange for that time, but every single day that they walk out that door, yeah. you're hoping that they come back. They're volunteering yeah. to come back the next day. Yeah. So treat them as such. Don't treat them as pieces that get moved around the chessboard yeah. or just a number on a spreadsheet. Like yeah. you, ultimately, yes, the business has to be profitable. You can't give away the farm, but you can be generous. You can yeah. be flexible. You can understand what really matters to them. I mean, career progression plan was not a phrase that was ever in my lexicon, <laughs> <laughs> but apparently that's really important. Yeah. I had to learn that. Um, yeah. And values. I think mm -hmm. for me, it all really boils down to values. If if it's a good values fit, so we got very, very clear on our values four or five years ago <laughs> as a business, and that was pretty transformational because that now is baked into everything that we do, obviously yeah. the hiring process, but also then, um, you know, your quarterly reviews, um, yeah. bonuses, our shout outs in our team meeting every Tuesday morning are all based around people demonstrating yeah. business values. So if you've got people whose 
natural values are aligned with the business values and really aligned with your personal values because you know that's generally where the values of the business come from right it's it's the person who started the thing it, it sort of becomes an extension of them yeah so if those things are aligned you, you're gonna go pretty well yeah i think yeah core values i think you know i think so many companies that i especially the smaller ones that are getting started maybe skip that piece and then they well you do at the start don't you? yeah and, and i think it's then right actually if you want to scale, you know, you've got to get people on board the train and to get people on board the train, you've got to, they've got to, you know, that core values fit. So spending time with your team, thrashing them out and discussing them. And, you know, yeah. I love the fact that you say, um, you know, on your Tuesday sort of stand up meeting, you know, you're sort of praising people, you know, and referring back to the core values, oh, bringing, bringing them back in all the right? time. Yeah. That's, that's not led by me. That's, that's them giving shout outs yeah. to other team members. Yeah. So it's not coming from me. It's not you know, coming from the top Yeah. Um, to the point now where I don't have to be in that Tuesday meeting every week, which is yeah. fantastic Yeah. Um, because Brilliant. they're running it. And, you know, you might have only been here for eight weeks and you you might find yourself running that meeting because yeah. we take it in turns to run that meeting. So That's good. Uh, yeah. we, we were chatting before we started about EOS and traction. Yeah. So we've taken elements of that. We've, we haven't adhered to it yeah. fanatically, yeah. Um, but we've actually just done the people analyzer. Yes. Um, yeah, just this last week, yeah, uh, as a group, sort of going through and and looking at those values and and scoring people. Yeah, I yeah. Don't know if they know that, but <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done that bit yet. We discussed it internally. We're like, we were just sort of uncomfortable giving people a score. <laughs> well, we've used that internally as a management team so yeah, far. Yeah, it hasn't gone any any further than yeah. that yet. But it probably will because we're we're pretty big on transparency. Yeah. So we'll yeah. see. Okay. Right. AdWords. <laughs> I yeah. you've not, have you ever done a podcast without talking about AdWords? <laughs> uh, yes-ish. <laughs> yes-ish. Not very often, no. <laughs> so where, how did it all start? Where did the passion come from? Obviously, you've been doing this quite a while. <gasps> quite I mean, how did, it, how did yeah. it begin? And, and sort of, you know, I'm really intrigued personally how the, the, the stories of the, you know, well, actually. And then... Well, I, I, I grew up wanting to do something completely different. I grew up yeah. wanting to be a helicopter pilot. Um, <laughs> I think I saw something on TV when I was about six years old and went, Mom, that, you know, this guy hanging out the side of a helicopter flying around New Zealand, apparently it was. I've, I've since went back and found that show. Um, always wanted to do that. So um, I actually flew um, not too far away from you, actually over Blackpool Tower uh, oh, yeah. out of Preston Airport. Yeah. Uh, flew a Cessna before I drove a car. I <laughs> studied aeronautical engineering at university before I dropped out after a term in half an hour. Um, and I actually learned to fly when I was 20 years old in Hawaii, of all places. I oh, wow. somehow found myself in Hawaii for a, a summer with a working holiday visa, I should add. And um, saw all these helicopters flying around. I went, yeah, bugger it. Why not now? So, you know, I got the yellow pages out because that's how old I am. Called every single helicopter company in Honolulu and got myself a job the next day, basically sweeping out the hangar and computerizing this little four-person helicopter company and i went you know computers are gonna, they're gonna be big it's the future like let me help you with this yeah and i'll do it for free huh what well in exchange for you teach me how to fly and a little bit of beer money and they said yeah okay go on then well we'll do that and so i spent yeah i learned to fly flying around maui and molokai and yeah um yeah Honolulu. it was amazing and very quickly after that actually ended up getting a job for mm -hmm. lord hansen uh good mates with the queen down in blackbush airport just outside of heathrow and very quickly realized that every single one of our pilots couldn't wait to retire. <laughs> and I thought, this is not an industry I want to be in where everybody wants to leave. I don't want to spend the rest of my life being a glorified taxi driver, which is how they referred to themselves. Wow. So I decided um, in my mid twenties, <coughs> this wasn't the path. So up sticks and uh, went snowboarding in New Zealand for three weeks, stayed for three years, started my first business there, uh, built that up, sold it, moved to Sydney, about 20 years ago, good Lord, and just started consulting with businesses. I I'd, I'd, I'd built one business at this point. It was quite successful, but you know, I thought I was God's gift to businesses. And the thing that had helped me build that business was a book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yeah. And then when I got to Sydney, I discovered there was this thing called an E-Myth coach, an E-Myth consultant. And I ended up flying to California at two days notice, a month after 9-11, to go train with Gerber and his team and that was my MBA in small business. I've always loved helping small businesses grow. And then, and I sucked at selling myself into that because it was mindset and systems and team. And then we'll get to lead generation. Yeah, but 
I just need more customers, mate. When do we get to the bit where you get me more customers? Well, that's module five. It's Gerber. It's a system. There are oh. seven modules and that's module five. Can we just buy module five? No, sorry. It's a get out. Oh, okay. I sucked at selling it because they just wanted more leads, more customers. Yeah. And then I saw this guy, Perry Marshall, speak in 2004, his first time here in Australia, talking about this thing called Google AdWords, as it was called back then. And I just went, oh my God, this is what they all want and need. I'm doing that yeah. because that's going to solve the problem. I love helping businesses grow, but I'm clearly sucking at what I'm doing here. Sorry, Gerber, I'm going to stop paying you a fortune. And I went back to my mastermind, hair on fire. One of the guys in the mastermind said, don't bloody consult to me. I'll give you half my business. Come on, let's do this together. Let's go. We sold a hundred grand's worth of stuff in three and a half weeks. And I went, Ooh, this works. Okay. Um, and that was really the start of the, uh, start of the agency. Um, I was a bit slow for every 10 people I would go and talk to and, Oh my God, this thing's amazing. Nine would say, mate, I don't bloody care how it works. Just do it for me. Would you? Yeah, yeah. I was a little slow to, to take that on board, but that's basically <laughs> how the agency started. And I started yeah. doing it for people back in 2006. I love it. I love it. So sort of, uh, yeah. One, Probably one, a longer one. answer than you're hoping for. Then. <laughs> no, 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 no. We won't edit. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that sort of one client leads into two clients, leads into what is today. You know, uh, you it know. was yeah, it was a case of beer and a round of golf, and yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah. and then a little bit of cash. And I think my yeah, first yeah. client was about three hundred and ninety bucks a month or something. Um, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, um, I still have a... my second ever client is still with us. A oh, wonderful wow. Melbourne company. Oh, that's uh, fantastic, isn't it? That's a great and story. Still growing. Yeah. yeah. So when we look at um, ads, you know, different platforms, different types of ads. So obviously when we talk about Google, we've got um, well, obviously all, all different options. But when we, when we think of an e-commerce store, um, you know, quite often they've got ads running on whether it's YouTube ads, shopping ads, search ads, Facebook ads. Where mm. do you think that sort of most e-commerce stores should focus? Or is there a sort of split that you see commonly? I mean, I know it's a bit of a well, depends answer. But would you say there's a sort of a common split and, a, and a, you know, when the guys that are listed? Varies. It varies by location, I find. Um, whenever I speak in the States, which I used to love doing in the before times, <laughs> um, I would find so many retailers that might be spending 100 grand a month on Facebook, but they had never tried Google Shopping. Um, or they've tried Google once, they mailed the credit card yeah. and then given up and run away and said, this thing doesn't work. So I think most businesses can benefit from testing a few different things. Um, right. You know, brand search campaign, just to make sure that you show up, that's kind of a given. Yeah. Remarketing campaign, if you're an e-com retailer, then having remarketing and dynamic remarketing, you should be doing that. Yeah. A lot of businesses don't get around to doing YouTube because they just find it difficult to create videos. Yeah, yeah fair enough. But if you can create video, there is so much traffic available there. Um, I still don't know how Facebook campaigns work. My head of Facebook's a genius. He's world-class. He's built an amazing team from scratch yeah. over the journey, which is now a large chunk of the business. Yeah. Um, so that should be part of the mix. Yeah, it should be tested. Yeah. Every business is different. It, it obviously matters who your audience is and um, where they are and are they looking yeah. for the products yeah. and services you sell or are you selling something that's completely new that people don't know about, but once they find it, they go, Oh my God, yeah. I've got to have that. In which case maybe interruption marketing works better for you. Facebook, Google display, YouTube, or maybe you've got tens of thousands of people searching for the stuff that you sell yeah, every yeah. week, in which case get on search and shopping first, but really, yeah, test them all. Test them. Yeah, no, I love it. I think that's the thing. I think a lot of people, you know, it's, it's quite bizarre when I think when we speak to clients, I think you're saying a similar thing where they go, oh, yeah, we spend 100 grand on here, but we don't do that. It's like, well, surely if you're doing 100 grand on this, what's a couple of grand to test this or, you know, a couple of hundred dollars or you know, 5%, 10% of your spend to test different areas? Because that's where usually you find, oh, actually, <laughs> you know, that 100 grand is now 200 grand because we're doing 50K here, 50K here. You know, this is just on spend maybe. <laughs> next yeah. thing we've doubled the business sort of thing yeah we, we do tend to get a little bit stuck in our way of thinking yeah. and we've heard yeah. a story from someone in a mastermind or we read a blog and we thought oh we've just decided that that thing doesn't work but yeah. you don't really know until you try i mean yeah. take a cue from your competitors are your competitors running google shopping yeah. ads? are your competitors yeah. um running youtube 
it doesn't mean that you should follow competitors blindly. Absolutely yeah. not. But it's it's they're signposts, they're clues as to what might work. Yeah. So you've touched on or you mentioned shopping. Shopping's a topic that shopping ads yeah. is a topic we've covered quite a lot and something that we are super passionate about here at the agency and on the podcast. So I'd love to delve into shopping a bit. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> what would be your sort of, um, I think things have changed quite a lot personally this last sort of 18 months with smart shopping and you know, different things. Um, what would you say are some of the go-to things, strategies that you're working on at the moment that are working in shopping? I really push back against smart shopping back in the yeah. early days. You remember when it was called goal optimized shopping campaigns. It's just the world's worst name. Yeah. Um, our rep pushed pretty hard on a couple of accounts, uh, black Friday last year, and we moved some products for a few clients over to smart yeah. shopping and lo and behold, we have seen some really, really good results. Yeah. Not all the time, obviously. I think if you go back two, three years, I think we, we worked out it was around about sort of 25% of the time smart shopping was worth keeping on. Sometimes yeah. it would work really well for three, four months and then fall off a cliff. Yeah. Those were the fun days. Um, other times it just wouldn't work at all, just wouldn't hit targets at yeah. all. And then sometimes it works, but it really wasn't that great. I think the thing that's made the difference for me is target ROAS, the, the bidding yeah. model behind yeah. shopping just works so, so much better than it did a couple of years ago. You know, machine... Google obviously is you know, the biggest and best AI company, at least outside of China. And they are putting the power of DeepMind and all of that lovely yeah. AI stuff to work. And it's very, very good, at yeah. least for the time being, while um, before Apple block everything and before, while we still have third-party <laughs> cookies, right? Before the gold uh, so yeah, again, smart, yeah. shopping, smart shopping generally works very, very well. But if you're brand new to Google, then I think you should spend the time to learn how to do it the old school way yeah. to collect the data that you really need when yeah. you're starting out to see are the right people seeing my products? Because yeah. I, as I'm guessing your listeners know better than the vast majority of podcasts that I'm on, yeah, we don't get to use keywords with yeah. shopping campaigns. We don't get to say, Hey, people that are searching for this, show them my products. Yeah. You're up leaving it up to Google to make that match. And you really want to know, so yeah. especially in the early days are are my products attracting the right people do i need to to, to do some work on my product feed to educate google yeah. as to uh who the right people are because so you would say right so we're saying now that smart shopping has definitely moved on you know just even in this short what is say maybe 18 months 12 months really moved on yeah. um a lot better than it was you're seeing you're personally seeing a lot more success so do you, do you tend to run smart shopping campaigns for clients and manual campaigns as well? Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're, I mean, you're doing sort of a hybrid. Yeah. Most, most of the time it's going to be hybrid. Some are smart yep. shopping only, which yep. uh, surprises me, especially where yep. we were a year ago. Yeah. Um, and then some will be manual only where we just either yep. haven't tested smart shopping yet for them because things are going so well. You know, when things are going really well, you just don't want to chuck a spanner in the mix, <laughs> right? Because Google yep. seems to. Yeah trust long-term data i mean i'm sure you've seen the same accounts i have where you look at the setup and you just go this is appalling this should not be working <laughs> and everything's 10 out of 10 quality score the yeah. thing is printing money and you're just yeah, like yeah. i'm not touching that <laughs> i'm not going near it because back in the day yeah when i was younger and my ego was bigger i go oh, this is rubbish oh, i'll show yeah. you that this is i'll do it the right way and then boom yeah yeah, yeah. You know, do that once or twice and then you go yeah. okay yeah i'll be a little bit more Maybe careful we'll just take it steady yeah. here so, yeah, so okay so we've got this hybrid model we've got smart we've got manual so maybe we go maybe just go stay on stay on smart for a second so mm. what what things can somebody implement over and above just a standard smart campaign so maybe is there are there things specifically that they really want to drill into the feed and make sure the feed has got this 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 you know, I no doubt you've looked at a thousand feeds yeah. over the over the years, and you know, there's always there's the obvious things. But what would you say feed wise that is to really get like a ten out of ten or a, yeah, know, yeah. a good high score or um, for smart specifically? What would you say? Well, let's even before we get to the feed, let's talk about what's going to make the difference between you and another retailer. Because yeah. when we're all using, I get asked this all the time when we're all using the same black box. 
what makes the difference? Yeah. Surely we're all going to get the same result. Well, not necessarily, right? So the quality of the data that yeah. you give the machine and the quality of the fee, the, the, the creative, the products themselves, that's going to make a huge difference. Yeah. So when I say data, I really mean tracking. Yeah. So if you are handing all of the power over to the machine and you're using a tool like Target ROAS, yeah. Target Return on Ad Spend, sorry for the acronyms, but I yeah. figure your audience is pretty cluey, so we should be good. Um, <clears throat> and you really need to make sure your conversion tracking's tight. You need to know that, yes, it's passing through the right revenue amounts. It yeah. is tracking the right conversions. Um, I'm a big fan of using Google Ads conversion tracking rather than Google Analytics because yeah. I think that if an ad has played a part in that journey over 30 days, then the ad should get some credit for it. Yeah. Maybe we don't need to go into attribution, but if you use Google Analytics, which is the easy, lazy way to, to track things, you're going to miss a, really about a third of your sales. Yeah. That's data that you can pass back into Google Ads, which will improve things. So getting your tracking sorted out is absolutely the first thing. And then, yes, move on to product feed, as you said. Um, product type is such a, an underused part of feeds um, because it's always been optional. Yeah. You know, Google product category used to be mandatory. Now it's optional, but people yeah. kind of seem to remember, oh, that was important once. Yeah. I should probably look after that. Google don't really care about that one. Product type is well worth doing. Yes. Um, custom labels so that you can move products around in your account so that you can have a campaign that only targets those five products. Custom yeah. labels, really, really useful for that. Um, getting cog, getting some extra data in there like cogs. So if you can get cogs into your feed cost of goods, yeah. then that opens up a few extra fields inside the interface so that you can start to see gross profit inside yeah. the interface at the point where you're making decisions. Now, most decisions around bidding these days are going to be made for you. So we don't need to fiddle with bid adjustments the way we used to but it's still very useful to understand yeah. that. So using custom label for uh, margin, uh, yeah. product margin. Yeah. Because so someone was just asking my group this, this morning, like how should I structure shopping campaigns? And there's a lot of different answers to that questions, right? Yeah. But I think yeah. a, a nice easy way to get your head around it is just profit margin. Even if that's as simple as high, medium and low. Yeah, yeah. Because you're going to bid those campaigns at a certain amount we want it to be profitable. So I think starting there. And then Andreas, um, I always forget the name of his business. I think it's uh, Creolytics. He's in Europe. He's done some brilliant research. Absolutely fantastic guy. Very, very smart. Works with some of the best brands. One of the best Google shopping people there is out there. I don't know if you've had him on the podcast, but no, he is an no. absolute genius. He's done some amazing research around the, the impact of price um, and you would have seen it in Google Merchant Center, right? You know, all of those price comparisons. There's still a large chunk of blue there. There's still like most of your products it says I can't find a comparison for. Yeah. Even if you sell products that everybody else sells. Oh, well, oh, let's come back and talk about GMC in a second. Um, but he's done some great work that shows if you're just a little bit more expensive than the other people in your market, you're going to get a fraction of the impressions that they are. That scares me a bit. Because that implies if you're a little bit cheaper, then you're going to get the lion's share and winner takes most. That becomes a race to the bottom. And I yeah. don't like no, discounting. But if, if there are maybe a couple of lost leaders and you know they're lost leaders and you know your numbers and you can attract a lot of people to your store by giving up a little bit of margin on a few products, yeah, then yeah. that can be useful. Yeah, I like it. I like it. A lot of a lot of things there. I think, um, yeah, product feed. So we've got the product type, which, yeah, I mean, the amount. I mean, I probably look at two new feeds a week. I would say ish, and yeah, probably eighty five percent. There's maybe one product type if you're lucky. <laughs> maybe, yeah. or it's just not used, is it? Yeah. Most of the time, yeah. it's just not used at all. Yeah. Um, sometimes it'll be labels. Google product category copied across. But it's such a, a great opportunity to define yeah. your own taxonomy and, yeah. again, give Google <clears throat> more signals. Um, just on the point of signals too, customer match list. It's a stupid name, yeah. but they've just opened that up. So the, there used to be a requirement there that you had to have spent 50 grand lifetime in your Google Ads account and everything had to be tickety-boo for the last 90 days. Otherwise, you couldn't use it. At the recent event, what, 
three, four weeks ago. Um, they said those limits are gone. So everybody now can upload a, an email list, essentially. So if you've got a list of prospects, if you've got yeah. a list of past customers, yeah. get those loaded up, let the yeah. machine see that data because that will then get uh, taken into account with all of that smart bidding. Yeah, no, that's some fantastic um, tips there, I think. Um, all those stacked together. I mean, co cost of goods, pulling that through, pulling margin through. If you can get at it, you know, that's the that's the usually the, the, the challenge with some of those, isn't it? It's getting that pulled through if it's not in there initially. Sometimes you're but, reliant on your, on your client's dev yeah. who's part-time and two months behind <laughs> and they've got a massive list. And yeah. it can be tricky sometimes to, it to get that. It. Yeah, it'll go on the list, but <laughs> it needs to be on a priority list. Yeah. So, okay, that's some you know, fantastic bits on the, on the smart side. So on the manual side then, so we've, we've built out a better feed. We've got better product data coming in. Um, um, on the smart side, obviously, and on the manual side as well. But when we're structuring the campaigns and building out the manual campaigns, what sort of tips would you give for that? Um, I guess the main tip would be have more than one campaign. Let's yeah. start with the basics. You know, don't just think of it as, oh, I've done, yep, shopping, tick that off, I've got one. Yeah. Martin, I always forget his surname, Rottinger, I think it was the the YouTube video that blew us all away. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The keyword you know, sculpting. Started, yeah. Yeah, and we all use that. I oh, remember seeing that for the first time. I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh, like, I don't know anybody that didn't watch that multiple times. We yeah, like, I remember. Oh my God, this guy's a frigging genius. And this is back in 2014. Um, that strategy still works, but it's starting to break down. Like the guys are telling me that um, the campaign priority isn't being respected as much anymore, that negatives even sometimes are not being respected, even on manual, which mm. is, really disappointing um I, I don't have any firm data to give you on that that's kind of pretty mm. anecdotal at the moment some agency savvy members have said similar things to me privately so yeah um at a minimum let's say brand non-brand you need to yeah. treat those two groups yeah. separately um after that well yeah go watch martin's video and figure out what makes sense for you i've seen some crazy stuff where people are trying to um, automatically move products from one campaign to another based on current performance. So you look at the actual ROAS, not just your product, product margin and the predicted performance, but mm. what's the actual performance in this thing we thought was going to be a three, but it's running at six. Oh, let's mm. pick it up and move it into this campaign over here. Mm. Fred's tool, Optimizer, yeah. will actually do a, a, a reasonable job yeah, at, at doing that. Yeah. Um, most businesses don't need to go to that mm. level though. Um, you know, titles we didn't talk about titles before but probably the single biggest thing you can do to your product feed is understand the search queries that people are finding you by and make sure that your titles do a good job of matching that intent yeah there's so yeah. much that can be done i mean yeah you see a lot of feeds and uh, it's better than it was two three years ago i think there's a better understanding but most people still have that perception of yes but this is how i want it to display on my store so that's the title I'm going to use. They don't realize that, well, we can have a different title yeah. that we give to Google and a different one that we give to Facebook and a different one that we give to Amazon if you want to. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the same thing that's displayed yeah. on the site. That alone yeah. may just make someone just, oh my God, I didn't <laughs> yeah, know you could do that. That's so yeah, cool. that's, a, that's a weekly conversation for us, yeah. So we take the feed and then we manipulate the feed and we, we change the, what, you can do that? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, where we can, yeah, and then we push With it back rules. in. But then we have to. I don't need to change it ever again. Yeah, what? We don't have to go onto the website and change all the titles. No, <laughs> we can do like a find and replace <laughs> and add. I, I'm I'm constantly amazed by how blown away people are by by little things that you can do with automation, whether it's yeah. script or even using auto rules in an yeah. account. Yeah. Um, this was not very long ago. I won't mention names because it's really embarrassing for the person involved. They're not a team member. This was a client. But they had somebody going into the office every Friday night and every Monday morning and, and pausing things. I was like, we can do that, you know, all automatically. You, you don't need to be pressing the button every Friday night. Like they were literally driving back to the office at 10 o'clock on a Friday wow. night to pause okay. things. I was like, please don't do that anymore. All right. So on, you mentioned the word scripts. If you were, you know, so you're running shopping campaigns, um, what would be maybe one or two scripts that you would run? or what would you be your advice oh, on that? Just one or two. A, we had a really cool one um, a yeah. while back. So 
obviously if you've got a, a product feed and that product shows as out of stock, then Google's automatically going to stop running your, your shopping ads for yep. that. We had a search campaign that was trying to sync up with that, but most of the traffic was going to category pages on the website. So our amazing dev, Charlene, she is absolutely brilliant, wrote a script that basically got the URL from the ad group, visited the page, looked at the various products on that category page, counted the number of products and the number of products that were out of stock of those, because on the category page, you, know, you might have 12 products and seven of them say out of stock. And once we hit a certain threshold for that percentage, then it would pause Stop. the ad group. Uh, I thought that it. was really yeah, clever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't come up with it, which makes it yeah. even better. <laughs> a similar, similar to the sort of sizing of a product if you you know, if you're selling a size seven brown Nike, I don't think you buy a brown Nike maybe, but, but if you, if you search for that size, that particular product, but you've only got the size seven in say, and you haven't got the four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, you might, you might not want to show it because you've only got one or two or three in stock that are certain yes. sizes rather than the whole. Yeah. Yeah. No, that yeah, is smart. I've not, I've not heard of that one. That's a really smart one. Yeah. I was, I was impressed. We do a lot of work with uh, data feed watch. I really like yeah. the guys at data feed watch yeah. Jack and the team. Um, they've done some training with us and the team yeah. over the journey. Um, really good product. Um, that's another thing I think we should add to that list of, of things to do is not necessarily pick the, the free app when you go to your Shopify store and figure out yeah. how to start getting data into Google Merchant yeah. Center, something like data feed watch yeah. is well worth the dollar yeah. a day that it's going to cost you. Yeah, we've got a great episode with Data Feed Watch. Um, oh, cool. the, the number escapes me, but we'll, we'll tag it up in the show notes. But about episode 30 ish, I believe, somewhere there. Um, but yeah, we're a fantastic company. We're a massive fan of Data Feed Watch as well. That 100% recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, right. So, you're taking accounts on, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at um, various um, e-com stores on a, on a weekly, daily, weekly basis, depending on how busy you are and what's going on. Obviously you've seen a lot of accounts over the years, hundreds, thousands. Um, how do you sort of usually sort of turn things around when things are failing? What are, what, what are the reasons why most accounts are normally failing or is there some sort of regular patterns you see and then where, how, and what do you sort of do? When you go into those accounts, what are some of the specifics that you can go in quite quick and look at specific things and change? Yeah. Um, oh, good question. For me, I go back to fundamentals, go back to first principles. And the first thing you want to understand is, well, why have results changed? Is it that less people are searching for this? Obviously, that's virtually impossible with smart <coughs> shopping, of course. But for your regular shopping campaigns, for your search campaigns, just getting that back to basics. Okay, results have changed, but what powers that result? If we're talking about you know, a search campaign, um, cost per lead, well, that's cost and the number of leads. So which one of those has changed? Um, has our average CPC changed? Has impression share changed? So the same number of people are searching, but we've just yeah. got our ads in front of a lot less of those. So I built a data studio tool that will do a lot of that analysis for you agency savvy members get it for free we still don't have a sales page for it it's it's exclusive to agency savvy members at the moment but um all of the training videos i did for that are on our youtube channel so that'll give you sort of a good idea of what it can do yeah the wonderful thing with data studio is you can embed videos in the actual report and once i found that out i'm like oh i can do i can do my whole audit process in the one tool so one page for training and then one page for data then the next page for training on the next topic then a page of data on that topic. So training yep. data, training data, training data. So it's 20 pages of training with 20 pages of your data in that tool. Agencies, every members love it. So starting to diagnose the problem by pulling it apart a few different ways yeah. and looking for that. I think there's really only three levers. Well, let's add data to this, but bidding, targeting, and messaging. Those yep. are the three main levers that we all have to play with yep. in an account. So you pull it back to basics. Um, bidding these days, probably smart bidding but what's changed there did we change targets has the average cpc changed what's happening there with our targeting has somebody added a new neg and that's killed things so somebody messed yeah. with the product feed it's it gets harder right when you've got yeah. a team and you've got multiple yeah. people working yeah. on the account you need a good system for those things but breaking it down into those component pieces has 
the messaging changed on the website. I mean, how many times have you had a client that said, oh, no, no, we, we changed websites yesterday. Oh, did you need to know that? <laughs> yeah, it's like 300 404s or 5,000 404s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and whole new product IDs yeah. and... 301s, what's a 301? <laughs> yeah, it would have been useful to know that. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's yeah. baked into now our quarterly business reviews. Any changes to the website coming up that we yeah. need to know about? Any yeah. that you think we don't need to know about? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I know we've had a, yeah had some fun and games recently. With, well, like, we, 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 and, we, and we, I can we, understand it, yeah. right? From their point of view, I actually drew this out on a whiteboard a while back for somebody. Of you think about so there's, there's the business, right? With all these different components: ops, finance, admin, HR, sales, and marketing. Within that, you've got all the different types of marketing. You got PR, you got above the line, you got over the top, and then digital. And then within digital, we've got Facebook, we've got Google, we've got Organic and email and some other yeah, bits yeah. and pieces, right? But in their world, they're spending all of their time at the top, and it's a it's a triangle that points down with a teeny tiny little bit of time set aside to worry about this geeky thing called Google Ads. Our pyramid is completely the opposite of that. We spend all of our time down on that bottom layer, and occasionally we'll have a conversation with them about the business itself, what are the goals, what's changing. Yeah. So recognizing that in their world. They're incredibly busy. They're wearing 12 hats. They're running around like a headless chook. Yeah. And yeah, they might not realize that yeah. changing the entire website was an important thing to let you know. I think Most um, of the time they do, but it's I kind of understandable you, when they don't. If you're listening now, I would sort of pause and maybe rewind 90 seconds because when you're having that dialogue with your agency or with your you know, your guy, lady in, in the business that's running your ads, you know, just that dialogue between the teams to let them understand what is going on in the business, you know, what, what's, what's coming up, what's changed? Oh, we've got a whole new range. We're actually ditching that range. Hang on a minute. That was 80% of the revenue. Why we did? Oh, well, we can't get it anymore. We've lost the relationship. Right. Okay. That's major news. That's majorly going to affect what's going to happen with the, with the, with the revenue. So we need and to that understand is, that. And you're dead right. That's often one of the biggest reasons why that ROAS has changed yeah. or why revenue has yeah, changed yeah. is because the best selling products yeah, are now yeah. out of stock. Yeah. And nobody's noticed yeah. because it's buried in a feed. Yeah, but it it's was so common. Of that feed. Yeah, so, so common. We've got a client that sells the PlayStation 5 and from what I understand, getting stock is a nightmare. So when you get stock, it obviously goes crazy, <laughs> you know, like extra hundred grand or whatever it may be. And then they come out of stocks like, yeah, they're out of stock. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. But understanding that, if you didn't know that, you think there's some major issue, you know, at, at the top level without sort of digging in and looking at the product level. And I would imagine to the business owners listening to this five minutes of the conversation, they are just banging their head against the wall right now going, you idiots, that's so bloody obvious. <laughs> But yet, but tell us, <laughs> you know, we've, we've both known many agencies along the journey, and I've probably made this mistake myself earlier on in my career, where we forget to talk about the business, yeah. about the business yeah. goals, about those bigger yeah. things that are going on inside the business. We are buried in the tech because that's where we feel most at home and playing with pivot tables and needing yeah. spreadsheets, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we sometimes forget to have those conversations. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, As you said, we've got to break down those silos and everybody just needs to talk more often. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I think um, if you're not speaking to your guy, you know, your your team, your um, agency, then there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of problems that no doubt will arise. And um, so I think, you know, you need to nip that in the bud. So crystal ball time. If we were looking um, maybe a couple of years into the future, you know, where, where do you see some of the things going on the PPC side? We will have less control. Yeah. And Twitter will keep blowing up and we'll all be bitching and whinging about it, but there'll be nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Um, but like Performance Max, right? This new campaign type. Mm. I really don't want to try it. I really want to stick my head in the sand and be an ostrich and go, it's going to be shit. Um, that is exactly the opposite of what Perry and I have been teaching for 15 years, mixing search and display and YouTube. Yeah, mix it all together. The machine will figure it out. Will it though? Because, you know, the machine has shown time and time again that it, isn't always brilliant at that um but we'll test it we've got some clients that are super aggressive and love trying yep. the new things which is wonderful and then we've got clients at the other end of the scale that are more conservative and go we don't want to touch a beta until you know it's going to do well yeah. for us yeah so we'll test it and um maybe we'll have a chat in yeah. a few months time and Get talk back about on. that yeah did it work um i think yeah the the ai genie is is well and truly out of the bottle Google are never going backwards on that. You know, if you read, I was doing a webinar this morning and 
I found a couple of screenshots of some of Google's sites and they actually have a page that's pretty much titled, this is what we believe or, or something along those lines. And it literally says on this page, extremely hard, if not impossible for a human to do when they're talking about their smart bidding model. So they're basically saying the engineers at Google are patting us on the head and going, ah, oh, little humans, Good it's luck. a bit complicated. <laughs> just let us do it for you. Good luck. <laughs> um, just what? Just give us the credit card and get out of your way. Is that, that that's basically what Google want, right? It's just like, what's your URL? What's your credit card number? We'll do everything in between. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope we don't get to that world anytime soon. I hope that the amazing community that this is, and we've got some phenomenal people, right? I mean, I'm sure you've had many of them on the podcast, but guys like Brad Geddes and Fred Valleys. Yeah. Um, Kirk Williams that have all been around a yep. long time and are continually gently nudging, I won't say fighting for, but gently nudging people at Google in the right direction. I've had some stand-up arguments with people at Google here and at Singapore, and um, usually it's more civil than that, but hopefully they do continue to listen to us yep. as a community and they recognize that data is a really important part of the piece and you can't keep hiding it all and calling it insignificant yep. and expecting us all to be really happy with that we need that data to go back to our clients and, and yeah. prove value we want to use that data for yeah. other things we're not saying we should own all the data but we should be able to use it right yeah so i think the automation is going to continue i think the ai is going to continue yeah. i think we're probably going to continue to uh lose little bits of control over the journey I don't think keywords will go away but i think we'll see some changes more make more changes to Match type. Match type so. I hope something like negative keywords doesn't go away. But you know, you look at smart shopping, you can kind of start to see the writing on the wall. Yeah. Um yeah. on the messaging side, I strongly suspect in two years we'll be in an RSA only world yeah. on the search side and maybe an RDA only world on the display side. So yeah. sorry, responsive search ads rather than expanded text ads. I don't yeah, I'm pretty sure that will happen at some point. Yeah. Just because you know, again, they're patting us on the head and saying, get out of the way, little humans. You don't know what you're doing. Um, YouTube yeah. and display, maybe less changes there, but again, probably more simplification to the audience yeah. side of things. You know, we've, we've seen the, the loss of custom affinity and custom intent and all of that being merged into custom audiences. I wasn't very happy about that. Yeah. But again, we get, there's no point bitching and whinging, right? Yeah. Um, the simplification of remarketing audiences. We used to be very, very granular with that. I wrote an article five years ago. It's on Brian Dice's blog, digitalmarketer.com. Um, super granular. That's how we ran things for years. It's called the remarketing grid. If you feel nostalgic, nostalgic and you want to go read it. But these days, the machine understands recency. The machine understands the different behaviors that everybody's made on your site. Which products did they hover over? What were the value yeah. of those products? What got added to the cart and what didn't? how long they were looking at each of those products. The machine knows all of that, at least, again, at this point in time before uh, a few changes happen over the next 12 months. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to be an interesting journey, right? Yeah. It's going to keep on yeah. changing and the pace is probably only going to accelerate. So I think we'll, um, yeah, a year from now, we'll get you back on. We'll have a regroup on the, on the, on the machine and what, how, how it's been working for us. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, that. right. I always like to end every episode on a book recommendation. Now, obviously, you have a lot of books out there, and you have your sort of most recent books. So I think we'll do a we'll do a, a two pronged um, end to the episode if it's okay with you. So, tell us a bit about the book. You know, I know it's the, is it the sixth edition of the um, Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. <laughs> Here's one I just oh! on my desk, Richard. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> It is the sixth edition. Um, I was very lucky. Brian and Perry did the first three without me and then got me involved uh, eight years ago to yep. write the technical bit of the book. But yes, uh, we're told that's the best-selling book on Google Ads in the world, yep. which is rather lovely and makes my mum very proud. <laughs> um, that's good. Uh, best book, I, well, I, I'll give you a couple of different answers to that. I'll give you the books that changed my life, which was Cashflow Quadrant by Kiyosaki yep. Yep. and The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yeah. My mate handed me those two as I was starting my first business 22 years ago. Those two books changed yeah. how I thought about business and money forever. I can't remember how I used to think about business and money. That's how much they changed me. Yeah. And then, yeah, book recommendations these days. Usually whatever book I'm reading is one of my favorite books of all time. I get 
so into a book. But actually, yesterday, I did get a new book arrive. Michael Lewis is just one of my all-time favorite nonfiction authors. The guy is a bloody genius, like Liars Poker, um, Flash Boys, The Big Short, Moneyball. That's all him. Yeah, right? A whole bunch of them got yeah. turned into movies, but they are absolutely cracking books. Yeah. And his yeah. new book, The Premonition, which is all about the pandemic, but it's a, it's a beautiful story with some amazing characters told about the pandemic. Um, yeah, he is an absolute brilliant writer. So if you, if you mm, want to go mm. have a good read, a nonfiction read, Michael yeah. Lewis. We will favorite. tag that up um, and we'll get it on the list. Well, thanks, Mike. It's been an absolute blast um, having you on. I really appreciate you sparing the time. Uh, the guys goodness. that are listening want to find out more about you, more about what, you know, and get in contact. What's the best way to do that? Um, best way to find me is through the website. So websavvy.com.au because we're down here in Melbourne, Australia. So yeah. W-E-B-S-A-V-V-Y. I'm sure that'll be in the show notes somewhere. Yeah. Um, there's forms and stuff on there. If um, yeah, send, me, uh, send me a question. I love helping businesses grow. My email, my personal email is mike at websavvy.com.au. Yeah. Um, that probably means I'll get more spam now. But um, <laughs> send me a question. If you have a question, if you're running this stuff and you'd like a, a, a second pair of eyes on it and a second opinion, yeah. more than happy to take a look or just continue this conversation and, and answer a couple of questions. Um, if you like the training side of thing, if you want to learn more and you want your team to learn more, then yep, we teach a few hundred agencies how to do what we do. And that's over at agencysavvy.com. I've discovered I'm a, a teacher uh, across the journey. I absolutely love teaching. I could yeah. never give that part up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, whatever floats your boat. Um, I'm not massively active on uh, the socials. Um, I tend to try and turn off when I go home and go and play yeah, with yeah. the kids. Yeah, so, no, fantastic. Well, thanks, Mike. Find me on Twitter. I can definitely give it the ecom at one um, sign off in terms of the training. Our guy, you know, as as I said at the beginning, you know, we have we use the agency savvy training here at our agency. So I know it's a fantastic resource. So I definitely recommend that myself. So well, thanks, Mike. Um, we'll get you booked in for twelve months time, and we'll.